mama friend. Welcome back to the Mama Mindset Podcast. And as always, I'm your host and creator, Amy Cothran. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very excited to introduce today's everyday mom guest who is absolutely extraordinary, not ordinary. She is a foster mom and she started on that journey uh, about seven years ago, just right after, pretty shortly after I met her. I've actually known her for seven years now. Her name is Sasha. She's joining me today in this conversation on her foster parent journey. It's amazing. It's enlightening and it's, it's really eye opening. She has a beautiful story to tell. She tells us about the ups and downs of being a foster parent. She talks to us about tips and tools and resources and I understand a lot of my listeners are probably not foster parents right now. Some of you might be, some of you might be interested in joining the, the program and, and seeing if this is a, an area you would like to explore. I encourage all of you to listen to this because if you are experiencing this journey right now or something similar to it, chances are good. You'll know somebody, or you will know somebody in the future who might be going down this road and, and journeying through being a foster parent. So what that does is it helps you know how to support your mom friends. It helps you know how to support other parents that are going through something similar. And not to mention, there are a lot of things in this episode that we talk about that pertain to all moms in general, all parents in general, not just foster parents. We go through all of the ups and the downs, the tips, the tools, the resources, And in the end, she talks about her beautiful journey and what you can do as a foster parent. So grab a cozy beverage and join me in this conversational journey with my good friend, Sasha. Well, Sasha, thank you so much for coming on today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited to have you. You are a wealth of knowledge on this topic. And uh, when I had reached out to my other friend, if she who's fostering, she gave me a suggestion because I was asking and looking for people to come on the show. This is an area that I have zero knowledge in. And I wanted to make sure that I brought this to the show. And she mentioned you and I was like, hello, why didn't I think of Sasha? And for listeners who don't know, I've known Sasha for what? Well, you started watching Gracie when she was young. So seven years, probably. Yeah, I meant like think she was quite two. She wasn't even two. Yeah. And um, you were teaching at the daycare that she went to and you yes. were absolutely Gracie's favorite <laughs> person ever. Shasha. She would call you Shasha. And I loved it. Um, so why don't, don't you tell anybody she was my favorite too? I knew it. I knew it this whole time. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. And she didn't even go full-time there for a while. She was just going part-time and it was like the best part of her whole week. So she was I loved fun. It. yeah, I loved it. Well, you made our daycare experience there. Absolutely amazing. That's why we kept going back for as long as we did. Even when I wasn't working, I still had I her going to see you like one to two days a week. So I think that says a lot about you. You're amazing with children. So welcome to the show. Why don't you take a minute or two or a couple minutes and introduce yourself. And then if you want to just dive into your journey, just how you got started fostering, that would be amazing. Uh, like Amy said, my name is Sasha. Um, I have been a foster parent for six years. I, there have been highs and lows, goods and bad. Um, I always tell people when they ask me about fostering, It is the worst and best thing you will ever do in your entire life. Um, I was very blessed to adopt my daughter from foster care, but I have also reunified kids with their biological parents. I have worked on transitioning kids to non-custodial parents. I have helped kids age out of the system. I have been a guardian to kids who were older and didn't necessarily want to be adopted. I've transitioned kids to family members. So I really, in the last six years, I have seen a lot um, of different stories and, 
and seen a lot of the foster care system. I actually started foster care because um, while working at the daycare, we had a little boy who I just fell in love with and I found out he was in foster care and I became friends with his foster mom and really just started asking questions and finding out what was foster care? How could I help? What could I do? And at the time I wasn't necessarily sure it was something I wanted to do, but I wanted to ask the questions. And so she asked me to start doing what they call respite, which is I would just watch him on the weekends when she needed to go out of town. And I just fell more and more in love with him. And the more I thought about it and researched it and talked to different people about it, the more I found that it was just something I really wanted to do. Like kids are really my passion and I wanted to be a foster parent who could not just um, support the child that was in my care, but also support the bio family. Mm -hmm. And so I really finally took the plunge. Um, I want to say in like September and I went through the pride class. And at the time I was living in this tiny studio apartment and I was working at a daycare. And so I didn't make a lot. Um, but I found different resources to find housing that I would be able to foster in. And I just really started moving things around to see what I could do. And in the beginning of May, I moved into a two bedroom kind of townhouse type apartment. And then at the end of May, I ended up getting my first placement. And so like just, in like two weeks. Yeah. Like they're like, so, okay, she's set up. Here you go. And you're like, I saw yeah. ba boxes unpacked, it, but here we go. <laughs> yeah. I was not like fully unpacked. People yeah. had just brought, people are amazing and they just brought over toddler beds and clothes and toys and so like I just had all this stuff like strewn around my house and then I got a phone call and they're like hey we have this little girl and you know are you do you have room and I'm like well yeah and so they just brought her over um she didn't have much of anything just like a small bag of clothes that were too small um and in foster care they require that you get them into the doctor within it used to be the first seven days mm -hmm. um and then you for like a well check and then you have to get them into the dentist I think within the first like three weeks so there's a lot that comes with it mm -hmm. uh she had visits two to three times a week um, so it, it with was her, with her, by, with her parents yes. or family. Okay. Yes. Okay. So she, so you had, had to schedule and coordinate that along with your job. And I think we need to make sure that everybody fully understands you're doing this as a single woman. Yes. That's a, that's a huge integral part of your story, um, is you're working at a daycare and you're living on your own independently and you're doing this without the support of a partner or a spouse, like, Yes, which is, I mean, amazing and, and just beautiful. And I, I have a really good family support. I have mm -hmm. an amazing parents and my sister and her family, but they also live three hours away. Right. And so they are supportive from a distance. Um, but at the time, especially when I got my first placement, I didn't really have a support system. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of like, all right, here we go. So I received my first placement in the end of May. And then right around my birthday in July, I received a phone call for 
an eight-year-old boy. Um, and all the information they had was that he was autistic mm -hmm. and that he needed a home and was at the police station. And so I think it's really important. This phone call came in at like two o'clock in the morning for him. And I think it's not really talked about that you get phone calls at all hours of the day mm -hmm. and you pick up kids from, or kids are brought to you from not the greatest places. Like mm -hmm. this kid had been sitting in a police station since like seven o'clock the night before. Um, I've had to pick up kids from the hospital. I mean, it's not, it's not like it's ever uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, they're coming from a salon type of situation. I mean, these, yeah, it's going to be uh, it, almost every time is going to be like, I don't want to say inconvenient in a negative way, but it's going to be at two o'clock in the morning when you're in the middle of sleeping, or it's going to be at the least convenient time for you to go do that. And, and in a right. very traumatic, traumatic place that you're picking them up from. And you don't ever know. I mean, I've had kids that have come in in the middle of the night and they've needed baths right away. They're starving. So it's midnight and you're bathing kids and making macaroni and cheese. And, you know, I've at one time I had three kids in my house. I did eventually move into a three bedroom. I had three kids in my house and then I got a phone call because I was one of the only people who answered their phone in the middle of the night. I got a phone call for a sibling set of three and wow. I literally at one o'clock in the morning was moving kids in their sleep, mattresses being moved, you know, so that we could fit these other three kids in. Like you just don't ever know. And so when I first started fostering, I always told myself I would never say no unless, unless it was a safety risk. So I licensed myself from zero to 18. And I'll be honest, I secretly prayed I would never get a newborn because they don't sleep at night and I like to sleep at night. Um, and I promised myself I would always leave my phone off. So if mm -hmm. there was ever a time that there was a kid that needed somewhere to go, even if it was just for a night, my house was always going to be open. So I had my first two placements, um, a toddler girl and a eight-year-old boy. I had the girl for 15 months. Her mom worked so hard over those 15 months to get stable and get her back. And so it was super exciting to watch her reunify with her biological mom. Mm -hmm. The boy I had for 19 months and his dad was able to get stable also. And he was able to go back. And then from there, it was just kid after kid after kid. We never sat empty for very long. I never, my house was never there was never less than two kids here at one time. Sometimes there was too many kids here at one time. Yeah. But I did eventually find that working at a daycare and fostering is very difficult um, just because you have a lot of visits, you have a lot of a doctor's appointments, you have counseling appointments. So I did leave the daycare and go work for the school system, which is a little bit more flexible. Mm -hmm. um, plus you have summers off. Yeah. And so, there may be, a, maybe a little more understanding of the work that you're doing um, outside of work as well. You know, yeah. their understanding of the system of the, of the foster care system. So when you explain the situation, they're like, Nope, we understand you need to go do that. Right. To some probably. extent, probably. Right. Yeah. And they, yeah. They really, I mean, my bosses have always been amazing at you do what you need to do. Like yeah. you, you do what you need to do. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's been a really big blessing because 
you do not realize until you're in the middle of it foster care is very time consuming and Mm -hmm. it's very it's just very consuming Mm -hmm. well Um, emotionally too I would imagine the emotional side of it it would be things that people probably don't talk about like yeah this is going to take time and you need to make sure this is done it one week and this is done at three weeks and this is scheduled here and that's scheduled Mm -hmm. there but that energy and that brain power that it takes to emotionally process and emotionally feel the things that are going on is very energy draining. I, I mean, I can only imagine, I just know how it is even just being a parent, uh, just being a mother and of a seven, five and two-year-old, and you're just holding on to their emotions so much throughout the day that fostering on top of that, um, some very traumatic situations that you know of, or maybe don't know of and are trying to figure out that would be incredibly consuming. I, I only, I can only imagine, I would say. It, it truly is. And I think Mm -hmm. one of the hard things is that you as, especially as a mom, you always tried to, to shield your kids whether they're biologically yours or not, Mm -hmm. you always try to shield your kids from emotions. And there have been lots of times that I have dropped off kids with parents who I knew were not fully there during the visit and just sitting in the car, just bawling. Because they didn't want to go. They didn't want to go or the parent you knew they weren't going to interact with the kid. And so it was just going to be two hours of sadness. Um, You know, especially with younger kids, you're and that's not true. Some older kids are this way. You're their safe space. I mean, they love their biological families with all their heart, but that's not always their safe space. And so not only are you emotionally drained, but you come home from visits and kids are just dysregulated and angry. And even if it's a really good visit, they don't understand why it was a really good visit. Like, why couldn't it be like this? And then I wouldn't be in foster care. They don't, they don't grasp that concept. Mm -hmm. I don't even think teenagers in foster care grasp that concept of they're trying to get better. And so they're making more of an effort now. Mm -hmm. So there's just so much that goes into it that people don't talk about. So what if, what do you do or what have you done in the past to help with that transition from visits to, um, coming home? What, what helps with that transition? We have all, I, I say we, like anybody is helping me. I have always made it a super easy night. Mm -hmm. So They'll come home. I, if it's around dinner time, we'll do something easy like pizza or mac and cheese or chicken nuggets. And we'll eat in the living room. It's like the one time, you know, once or twice a week, we eat in the living room and we watch their favorite movie. And I'll put blankets out on the floor after we're done eating and we'll just all lay on the floor with teenagers. Sometimes we've done like manicures or if they just want to be alone, you know, I'll tell them you can sit on the couch, be on your phone, be on a tablet, you know, but I at least want to be in the same room as you so that they just know that there's not any big expectations when they come home Mm -hmm. and they know it's safe and they know that everything is, is okay. You know, that there's a little tiny bit of normalcy Mm -hmm. and that, that seems to help a lot. Something else that's really helped is if it's appropriate, I've, I've had bio parents that are completely appropriate. I've had bio parents that are, I always offer to let the bio parent walk out to the car with me and put the kid or kids in the car And sometimes just those few extra minutes of getting them out to the car helps a little Mm -hmm. bit. Sometimes, to be honest, Amy, sometimes these bio parents don't even know how to buckle in their kid. And so 
it gives you the opportunity to be like, oh yeah, you did a great job. You might want to tighten it just a little bit. If you pull right here and it gives you that chance of teaching them, you know, this is how to safely put them in a car seat or this is, you know, if you give them a hug and say goodbye, it's going to be better than if you, you know, linger. And it's just, you've got to find those little moments where you can teach mm-hmm. because a lot of them don't know. Mm-hmm. So how did you, um, learn to be so insightful with some of this? Was it just your experience or was it through a mentor? I mean, I, I've, I think you're already naturally an incredibly insightful person anyways, but to like take the extra steps and to know, to invite somebody to walk to your car with you, to me, that's like a little hidden gem. Like, how did you uncover like a little hidden gem like that and want to help the bio parents and those little teaching moments? I think for me, a lot of it was my very first foster placement. Mm -hmm. I think her mom, especially, and I didn't necessarily hit it off right away, but as I started dropping off, you know, her daughter at the department for visits. And as I, you know, would pick her up, I would realize she doesn't really know. No one's taught her what to do. Mm -hmm. And so there would be little things that I would see that I would think, oh, well, you know, what if I tell her this? And I would just do it in a very non-threatening way Mm -hmm. because the truth is is these bio parents look at you like I never took these kids away from their parents but they still see me as the enemy Mm -hmm. and one thing that I learned very early on is anytime that I meet with a foster parent I always just tell them thank you for letting me take care of your kid for right now and I want to work with you to get them back to you Mm -hmm. so that they don't think I'm the enemy because Mm -hmm. we can accomplish so much more working together than we can if they're working against me and I'm working against them. Mm -hmm. And so not necessarily that anybody taught me as much as I think it was just a shift in how I saw the bio parents. Right. Nobody really, nobody really tells you much about the bio parents. They always talk about the kids, even in the pride class, they talk about the kids and the behaviors and they don't talk about that. Some of these bio parents have been in foster care themselves. Right. You know, and so it's, it's definitely, it has to be a shift in the way you think. Mm -hmm. And it's not always easy. There, mm -hmm. there have been some really not good bio parents that I've thought there is no way I'm going to be able to work with this parent. Mm-hmm. And you just have to plug along and keep trying. Yeah. So how do you, how do I want to ask that question? How do you handle the, all of this emotionally? I mean, there's a dozen questions I could probably ask you on just the emotional side of it and how you handle it, but like that transition portion, for example, you know, we talked about how you transition kind of the kids and making it easy on them, but how do you handle the emotions of that and seeing them hurt or seeing them angry? And then, you know, cause we, I think as women, we really tend to absorb feelings. We kind of yes. talked about that all, already. Like we're like emotional sponges and I don't know where the hell that comes from, but we like <laughs> absorb all of the emotions of the people around us. And then pretty soon at least for me, I start to, not that I act like that, but, um, you know, other, it just really affects the energy in the room and starts to affect me as an individual. So, so how do you handle those moments? You have to feel it. There's, Mm -hmm. there's no way around it. There Mm -hmm. have been times that I have found out information that I have been so incredibly angry about that I just want to punch someone and I have made sure that the kids were safe and I have gone into the bathroom and I have called my mom or I've just yelled in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Um, Having somebody good to talk to 
is always a plus. Mm -hmm. I also have had a counselor through the last six years who really has nothing to do with the child welfare system. And it's really nice to be honest, because Mm -hmm. if I'm really mad about something, I can just be like, lay it all out on her. And then she'll just be like, oh yeah, that sucks. Yeah. And it, she's just like, that's terrible. And I'm like, thank you. That's all I wanted was like validation that like this situation was terrible. Yeah. But I feel like we are told, especially as women, like you have to be the example. You can't feel things and, and suppress and we just suppress it all down. And it's like, that's not healthy. And there has been times that kids have come home and they've just cried. And I've sat down and just held them and cried with them and been like, I'm sorry, this was really crappy Mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, this should not have happened. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the hardest thing for kids is when their parents don't show up Mm -hmm. and I sat with a kid and said, you know what, this sucks and I'm sorry, Mm -hmm. you know, let's go, let's go get an ice cream cone. When on the inside, I'm like, I just want to take someone out. How could you not show up to see your kid? Yeah. Like you're angry, Mm -hmm. but also being a human being, I realized you don't always know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And if for some reason I make a mistake in my daughter's life, I want someone to have a little bit of compassion, Mm -hmm. but it took me six years to get to that place of having compassion. (laughs) Yeah. It takes a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about it now, it seems so, you know, you're so even killed about even kiltered. Is that right? Even kiltered. You're so level-headed about it maybe, but I'm sure at the time it's like, this emotional roller coaster of ups oh, and yeah. downs and I'm crying. And then we're like, we're crying together and I'm so heartbroken, but we're crying together. So we're bonding. And, you know, yes. I'm, I'm now I'm confused because emotionally confused because I'm super sad, but I'm also really happy that we're bonding and we're forming this connection. But then I'm also angry at the parent because this didn't happen, but I'm also like guilty. Cause I shouldn't be angry. <laughs> you know, I should be compassionate. Like, I mean, parenting is tough. Like parenting, foster parenting, it's all tough, that emotional roller coaster. But then for you, all of the unknowns, all yes. of the, all of the unknowns of the situation. And you, as a foster parent, you truly are living court date to court date. Mm-hmm. You, there's always a plan mm-hmm. and whether that plan is ever followed is a completely different story. Mm-hmm. All it takes is for one judge to decide to send the child home all of a sudden or to send them to a family member. There's certain protocol that has to be followed, mm-hmm. but it's still so up in the air, you know you want to get attached to these kids because that's what they need is healthy attachments. Mm -hmm. But then you're also afraid to get attached because you're like, my heart is going to hurt if they leave. And it's true. There, there is an unspoken grief that comes even when you know that it's a good situation, the kid is going to, there is still like that unspoken grief of losing a child Mm -hmm. that was never yours to begin with. Right. And that, that is a really hard emotion to explain. How do you, how do you handle that then? I, in the beginning, to be honest, I just took another placement. So I didn't have to feel the grief Mm -hmm. over time. I'm learning that's not the best way to handle things. Mm -hmm. I feel like had someone stepped in and said, Hey, I think you might need a week or two to kind of feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. That probably would have been super helpful because Mm -hmm. I just went from, okay, this kid just went home this week full time. All right. I'm back on the list. Call me, you know, and they would. 
and I would be like, okay, yeah, I'll take them. And it would be like a day or two later. And that's just kind of how I dealt with it. And looking back now, six years later, not the healthiest way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Cause it is, it is hard to explain the grief. And so not very many people get it. Yeah. Grief comes in so many different ways though. I mean, I think a lot of times, I mean, I could do a whole episode on that, but grief comes from, you know, a a lot of situations. When we got Olivia's diagnosis, I talk about that as a grieving period. I'm, Mm -hmm. you know, grieving the idea of the child that, you know, that this idea of a, I don't know, it sounds silly, like perfect, healthy child. And then having this, I, this diagnosis of, of all of the unknowns that could possibly come within her life. And, and, you know, the fact that she may not have children someday and all of these things. I don't even know if I've talked about the, the depths of that on the, on the show, but that alone is a grieving process. Mm-hmm. There's so grief comes in so many different ways. So, and it's so hard to articulate. So in your right. situation, talking about that and articulating that people aren't necessarily going to understand it. So then when you're trying to talk about it or explain it and you don't even fully understand it gets, you know, I could imagine that you would end up just being like, well, now I'm not going to talk about it because this really (laughs) didn't help me in any kind of way. It just was more confusing, but it sounds like you have your family. So did that help a little bit? I do. I, my family has been really great about Mm -hmm. every kid, no matter the age or the length of time that they were here, they have loved every kid as a part of our family. It's amazing. And so for them, there was a grief process for every kid that went home as well. And so they understood it to a certain degree. So that did definitely help Mm -hmm. a lot of the kids that have either reunified with their families or have gone to family members, a good portion of them I'm still in contact with today. And so that helps as well. Mm -hmm. But that's not always an easy process either. And that takes some time and some healing Mm -hmm. on both sides for that to happen. Is it one of those things that it's really hard to give advice on even because it's like people have to kind of figure it out for themselves? Or is there something that you could say that you're like, nah, I really wish I would have done this, or this is really what I suggest? I, the truth is, is I think it's a case by case yeah. Even for me, it's a case by case situation. I have a former foster daughter who I see weekly mm-hmm. and that works for us. I have teenagers who have moved with a non-custodial parent. Well, he's a custodial parent now, but at the time was the non-custodial parent and they moved um, across the United States and mm-hmm. they still Facebook message me. And so it just really depends on the biological family and what they're looking at. Sometimes they don't want them, depending on their age, to remember being in foster care. And so it's easier to cut you out. Mm-hmm. Other times they realize that you've been in their life for such a long time that you're just an extension of the family. Mm-hmm. And so it really is hard to give any sort of advice on that because it just is where is their thinking? Where is your thinking? And can you make this work for the best interest of the kid? Mm -hmm. And that's hard. Yeah. So let's talk about with all, with that being said, and, and the foster kids transitioning out of your house, let's talk about the one who has not transitioned out of your house. Sweet Kennedy. (laughs) I'm not even sure. She's never even going to transition out of my bed. <laughs> I love that. I love this story. So can it, for the listeners, um, you adopted Kennedy. Yes. She is, she's now your daughter, which is beautiful. But before you start, I want, I want you to share your journey, but I have a question for you. Did you go okay. into foster parenting, foster care to adopt with the end um, in mind of adopting or was it just fostering in the beginning? Did What did that look like? I think in the beginning, it was just fostering. Uh-huh. But so in Idaho, it's a little bit different than other states. In Idaho, you are just necessarily a foster to adopt type home. 
So you start out as fostering, but if adoption becomes the end goal, you just are naturally asked if that, if there's no other bio family, then you are asked if you would like to be that option. In Mm -hmm. some states, you have to be foster only or foster to adopt or adopt. There's like three different licenses. Okay. And I think it's really important to understand in Idaho, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of under one umbrella. Okay. I knew going into it, I wanted to foster. And I kind of in the back of my mind thought, if it comes that there is a kid that needs to be adopted, I absolutely would not say no. To be honest, though, I was kind of looking at an older kid, Mm -hmm. like probably five or six and older. Mm -hmm. I wasn't necessarily looking for a younger kid because I, I'm going to be completely honest. I just turned 40 this year. So I was 34, 35 when I started. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't super young. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, it's always been thinking older kid wise. Mm -hmm. Right. And so how old was Kennedy when you got her? You want to talk about that story? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) So she was kind of like my little miracle. Um, She actually has older siblings, um, two of which were in care for six to seven months before she came into care. And then I was leaving on our annual girls trip and I got a phone call from the, I don't really know what you would safety assessor saying, I have this boy, he's six years old. Would you take him? And I was like, uh, I'm leaving town. Like I'm in Pomeroy. Do you need me to pull over and come back? And she said, well, no, there's a biological aunt here from Oregon. And she said, she will keep him for the weekend so that you can go on your trip. And I was like, okay, great. Awesome. So we went to Portland. I was with my, our girl members of the family. And Mm -hmm. I get this phone call from the same safety assessor. And she's like, Hey, we finally found mom. Um, she's pregnant. I want to give you a chance to get some stuff together. She's due late November. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you interested in taking the baby so she can stay with brother? And I was like, "Um, okay, that gives me a little over a month to find help. And so I said, yeah, I mean, let's be honest. There was a slight panic. Let's just like, there was a little bit of an, oh shit moment. Like, am I really ready for this? (laughs) It it wasn't a slight panic. It was a, oh oh, man, I nope. I don't want to do, I'm not sure I can do this. Yeah. yeah. And (laughs) so I want to say that was like Friday morning Mm -hmm. and then Friday late, early evening, the same safety assessor calls me back and says, surprise, it's a girl. And she was born this afternoon. And I just I'm got like, goosebumps. I have goosebumps everywhere. <laughs> and I was at the time I was with my mom, my sister, my two cousins and my aunt. And I remember the safety assessor saying, Sasha, she is super sick, like super sick. And she's like, She's going to have to be in the hospital for a couple of days. Cause I was like panicking. I was going to leave our girls trip and come straight home. Like I was on the phone with the safety assessor talking to my mom, like, cause we had all drove to Portland together. So I was trying to figure out how I could get back to Lewiston. And so finally the safety assessor was like, look, you can't do anything. You need to stay on your trip. And then when you come back, we'll figure out if she can even go home yet. Mm -hmm. So went on my trip, um, met her half brother's family in Portland so that we could, I could bring him home with me. We brought him home, got back to Lewiston at like eight o'clock at night. And I called the hospital and said, can we at least stop by and see her? So she was born on Friday. We met her on Sunday. Mm -hmm. We stayed for like an hour um super sick super super sick 
and Tuesday, I took Monday and Tuesday off of work. Monday spent the whole day at the hospital with her. Tuesday spent the whole day at the hospital with her. And then Tuesday afternoon, they're like, well, do you want to take her home? And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> Like, really... She's good. you guys are doing a great job here people let's just like, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing and so um, oh my goodness yeah so oh on my Tuesday they ended up letting me bring her home and she was four pounds 11 ounces and she was so small that they had to roll up a hospital blanket and put two rolls on each side of like the little car seat folding thing so that like it would like more cushion her in so she was like it was scary to hold her she was so small yeah I remember Um, seeing pictures of her and how tiny she was yeah and she she was very very tiny Mm -hmm. um and when I first brought her home she wouldn't eat she didn't want to eat uh she was born drug affected severely drug affected and she just cried all the time Mm -hmm. nonstop and nothing helped I had to syringe feed her for several weeks because she just wouldn't eat anything and so you just kind of had to like force food into her she wasn't gaining weight at about I want to say probably end of November, beginning of December, I started noticing that she was having seizures and I talked to her doctor about it. He was amazing. He's like, okay, let's keep an eye on it. Well, then in December she got RSV and that was the first time we almost lost her. She spent a week in the hospital and my mom being amazing, I called her bawling and was like I have two kids at my house and I have a baby who's about to stay in the hospital for a week and my mom's like give me three hours and I'll be there and she did she packed up a few outfits and came and stayed at my house and during the day she would come to the hospital and let me come home for a couple hours and I would take a nap and then I would go back to the hospital and spend the night and like I said she just never hit any milestones she really was just trying to work through the withdrawal Mm -hmm. at the time they didn't send babies home on any sort of medication it -hmm. was kind of like we're gonna send them home and then you're just gonna have to help them as much as possible make them as comfortable as you can and yeah it's about it. it it was really hard it was really hard. I didn't sleep a lot. Um, I, it was hard. Were you questioning what you were doing? Were you questioning whether you wanted to even be there in that position? There, there were times that I would like, remember just sitting on the floor and she would be like in the swing screaming. And I would be like, she needs to go to a different mom. Like she would be better with a different mom. And I think in the back of my mind, I knew that wasn't true, but in the moment, and there were a lot of those moments, Amy, I would think she just needs a better, like, she just needs a better parent. Like she needs a stay at home mom. Like I remember thinking that all the time, she just needs a stay at home mom. I work all, I work. And at that time I was taking a lot of time off because she was sick and needed me and my kids have always been my first priority, Mm -hmm. but you do, you question everything. And I remember when infant toddler was finally able to come in our house. And I remember just to, just so the listeners know, infant toddler is a program through um, the department of health and welfare that helps, that helps provide support for children zero to three. It's a state funded program. I just wanted to clarify. So people knew what infant toddler was. It's a program that supports you at your home in a coaching environment. Yes. And the one thing that not a lot of people know is Mm -hmm. if you're, if you bring home a newborn from the hospital in foster care, Mm -hmm. if they were born drug affected, they automatically qualify for infant toddler. 
Perfect. So I think that's important to point out as well. Yeah. You always have that resource, even if it's not mentioned to you, you Mm -hmm. can push to use it. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember our coach coming and I was sitting on the floor and I was just crying and I was like, she doesn't do anything. She just lays here and she just cries all the time. And she's not hitting any of her milestones. And she was like, so compassionate and so sweet. And she was like, let's work through your feelings first and then we can move on to like how to help her. And she's Mm -hmm. like, she's healthy. Well, as healthy as she could be, you know, she's like, but you can't help her if you are feeling like a failure all the time. Mm -hmm. And I later found out when Kennedy was probably about six months old, her pediatrician said, I think you have postpartum depression. And I didn't know anything about that. And I honestly thought that the only way you could get it is by giving birth. And that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that once we kind of figured that out and we were able to get all of our help in place for her, it was a huge help. But Mm -hmm. in the process of her first seizure was probably the beginning of December. It took me advocating like crazy. And finally, we, when she was eight months old, we had a massive seizure that sent us to Valley Med and they immediately sent us to Spokane. Mm -hmm. And when we got to Spokane was finally when they took us seriously and the department took us seriously and we were able to get her on seizure medication and we were able to get her medically looked at and an MRI done. And, but until then we had been told, oh, well, it's probably not as severe as you think. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this tiny baby is having seizures every day. And you're telling me it's not a huge deal. When she was three months old, she weighed 10 pounds. Wow. And so she, she was not on the growth chart until we were able to medically get things under control. Mm -hmm. Um, Because of her seizures, it put, uh, it caused a crossing of her eyes. Mm -hmm. And so we have had to deal with that as well. Um, She has just, she is a living breathing little miracle and she has no idea she is and I have to remind myself when her strong willedness comes out (laughs) yeah (laughs) she's resilient she's multiple ways yeah (laughs) yeah when I when I tell her go go put your crayons away and she looks at me and she's like I don't want to and I'm like walking breathing miracle walking breathing oh my gosh I love that as I'm just like (laughs) I just I can you please just do what I ask Yeah, But infant toddler really got us on track because Mm -hmm. they were able to teach me how to get her to roll over, how to support her to roll over. These were things I didn't know. I had never had a newborn before. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any of my own biological kids. So it's not like I had that knowledge to pull from. Mm -hmm. So they showed me how to support her in rolling over, how to support her in sitting up, how, you know, what different toys I could get that would support her in learning to stand or Mm -hmm. learning to walk. And she went from not hitting any milestones till probably seven, eight months to she walked the week before her first birthday. Mm-hmm. So that's amazing. Yes. That's it, amazing. It, I say she walked the week before her first birthday and then started running like a month after her first birthday and has never stopped. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> yeah. 
So because of her seizures and because of all her medical stuff, we have had to have an MRI every three months Mm -hmm. up until she was two. And then she had a seizure the August. So August of 2020, she had a seizure. And then in November, she hadn't had any yet. And we were in for, she was sick or something. And we were in and I asked her doctor, can we try her without seizure medication? Mm -hmm. I know it's a long shot. I will watch her very closely, but can we try it? Mm -hmm. And he's like, sure. But then I want you to get an MRI to make sure that like, she's still doing okay. And so we weaned her off of her seizure meds starting in November. And then we went and had an MRI in June. Mm -hmm. And they told us that if the MRI came back, okay, we would only have to do them like once a year. Mm -hmm. And so she hasn't had any seizures since August of 2020. And she had her final MRI in June. And they told me that it looks so good that she probably doesn't have to come back unless I see any sort of issues. And um, like I told you before, she talks in paragraphs. Mm -hmm. She can count to pretty consistently to like 13. Mm -hmm. Um, And she'll be three in October. Yes. So she'll she'll be three three in October. October. Mm -hmm. She can tell you her birthday, her Mm -hmm. month and day. She can tell you her full entire name. Um, She's very bossy. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I mean, I think, you know, like you were talking about with Olivia, you, you know, having a daughter who was born drug affected and who has a biology that's not yours. There's always that fear of the unknown. Like Mm -hmm. you hear worst case scenarios that they hit 13 and they go off the rails and, you know, it is scary because you don't know. And I think as a parent in general, it's scary when you don't know your child's future. Mm -hmm. But I also look at how much she has overcome in two and a half, almost three years. And I'm like, if we can make it through that, like with the right counseling and, you know, the right resources in place, we're going to be fine. And the truth is, is a lot of foster and adopting from fostering is learning your resources, doing your research and advocating, 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 like, Mm -hmm. That is your main job as a foster parent and an adoptive parent. And really any parent is right. you are the only one who can advocate for your kid when they cannot advocate for themselves. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's super important. Mm-hmm. And keep trying, you know, like what you're saying, advocating and keep advocating, keep trying, keep moving forward, keep finding additional resources. Resources are good. Resources help us. That's what they're for. Help you. Mm -hmm. And there's to me, and and maybe this sounds cliche, but I feel like there's always help out there. There's always something else you can do. So just having that mindset of, okay, we hit a roadblock here. Let's pivot here. And like, let's proceed with down this path and see what happens. We hit a roadblock here. Okay. We're going to pivot and we're going to keep asking questions. Like the power of the internet is huge. This Facebook group is what my friend posted in. There's, there's Facebook groups out there for support systems and questions. And I always say that moms want to help other moms. And I feel like foster parents in me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine if you're a foster parent, you want to help other foster parents. Like you want to almost mentor. Am I, is that is it kind of a sense of yeah. community? So there should it, be a, somebody that you could even ask a question to or just vent to. Like, it, it really is. And the thing is, is, you know, don't, and this, again, this is for any parent, don't mm-hmm. ever just take someone's word for something. At one point we were told by a neurologist that Kennedy was autistic 
and that she wasn't having seizures, she was stemming. And I remember coming back so fired up that like the next day I showed up at my doctor's office and I was like, you're going to make us another appointment because this neurologist is a quack. Like this is the least autistic kid I've ever seen. Right. And he's like, what? And I told him what happened and he immediately got us another referral, Mm -hmm. you know, but had I not went with my gut, it would have been really easy to be like, oh, well, they're an expert. They know. And I'm like, no, you don't know. And the thing is, is sometimes in the foster care system, you as the foster parent know that kid more than the social worker, more than the school teacher, more than the bosses at health and welfare. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in the very beginning, you know them more than the bio parent. And so sometimes you can't be what people expect the perfect foster parent to be. You kind of have to be the bull that goes in and says, this kid needs this resource. This is what I found. You need to get me the paperwork or you need to get me the referral or you need to get me. And if it's not done in a couple of days, you call back. Mm -hmm. Okay, where are we at on this referral? Where are we at? You have to advocate for them like they are your biological child Mm -hmm. because nobody else, had you not advocated for Olivia, what would have happened? You would have never known. Right. You know, had I not advocated for Kennedy, we would have never seen her thrive the way she is now. Right. And so it's not just a foster parenting thing. It's just a parenting thing. Right. You have to be your kid's biggest advocate. And sometimes that means you have to go against the social worker sometimes when you don't think it's the best thing. Mm -hmm. I had a child in my care and she was under four months old and they had her at visits two hours a day, four days a week. And she was so dysregulated and it wasn't just with bio parents. It was like with long distance relatives. And I went toe to toe with the supervisor and with the social worker and said, this isn't right. And you're not doing what's in the best interest of this kid. Mm -hmm. And they're following a protocol So it's not necessarily that they're looking at the repercussions on what it's doing to this three month old kid who's in visits eight to 10 hours a week. They're just looking at, well, we have to show the state that we're doing X, Y, Z. Well, X, Y, Z is a baby. And, you know, Mm -hmm. so I think sometimes you have to make yourself unpopular Mm -hmm. and it sucks. (laughs) You have to make people angry sometimes. Yeah. But as a, as a parent of a biological child too, you, you have to do that. And I'm such a proponent of like sticking to your guns, being an advocate for your child, being an advocate for your family and doing literally what's best for you, for your family and for your child. Yes. Um, But aside from what everybody else says. So going back to, you know, Olivia, she saw a neuropsychologist. I I've talked about that a little bit. And the neuropsychologist actually don't know if I've shared this on this, on the podcast, but the neuropsychologist didn't officially diagnose her with ADHD, but said she has ADHD tendencies. And I was like, well, I could have told you that tendencies, right? She's not ADHD. I've, I've seen children with ADHD and she might have some tendencies, but the neuropsychologist solution to this was that we consider putting her into public school where she can get the support that she needs. And I was like, So you're telling me that I need to put a child who has attention issues in a classroom with 30 other students for an entire day worth of education Mm -hmm. by the time she's five, that's your solution to her being slightly behind in um, recognizing letters and sounds. I'm not talking like majorly behind. We're talking like slightly behind to uproot our family, to change our entire plan for homeschooling for this year for some ADHD tendencies and slight, slightly low scores in certain areas. I I was like, at first, at first I was like, initially she's the expert. Maybe I should listen to her. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe we should go along with this. She gets paid lots of money to be the expert in this. And then I was like, 
angry was my, honestly, my next reaction kind of pissed off. Cause I was like, you know, nothing about my child, you know, nothing about my family. And then I was even killed. And after I thought about it and I was like, you know what, this is great information. Thank you for letting us know that we need a little bit more work to do. You know, I didn't obviously talk to this woman in this way, right. but in my mind, I'm like, you know what? Thank you for that information. I really appreciate knowing where we are. That gives me some extra things that I need to work on with her in our up in our upcoming homeschool year, you know? So I was like, right. That is me advocating for her. Just in that one scenario, we advocate for our children all the time. But if I weren't going to advocate for, and if I were, if I weren't going to stick to my guns and do what I truly feel is right, it would have looked like, well, the expert said this, so we're going to change everything around without even analyzing it, questioning it and reflecting on what's best for her and what's best for our family. Right. So I love that you do that as, as a foster mom. I absolutely love that. Well, and I'm in that same situation where my daughter is almost three mm -hmm. and she is super smart, but she is also a very active child mm -hmm. and probably the one phrase I hate the most when people talk about her is they're like, oh, she's so busy because it makes me feel like she's naughty. And I'm mm -hmm. like, she's just really active. Like she doesn't sit down well. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like, she's only almost three, but I'm already looking at school wise. What are we going to do? Because mm -hmm. for me, homeschooling is not an issue, but I've looked into some private Christian schools who have smaller class sizes right. or have more room for her to walk around during class or be more active. They, because they have smaller class sizes, she can be more challenged because if mm -hmm. she gets bored, she does get naughty. Mm -hmm. So we're two, three, cause we're three years. Cause her birthday's in October. We're three years away from her being even close to starting school. And I've already had to think ahead, right? What is best for her so that school is enjoyable to her Mm -hmm. And what is going to get her the best education? Mm -hmm. I don't, and don't get me wrong. I work for the public school, but for her, for my child, I don't know that that's the best option. Right. And I think sometimes with foster kids, we're so quick to put them in public school because it's easy and it's free and the state wants that easy and free thing. And we don't look at other options. Mm. You know, you can't homeschool a foster child in Idaho, but there are other options. Mm -hmm. There are schools that have scholarships for foster kids that are not public schools. You that's know, amazing. That's amazing to know. Yes. I didn't know that. And that's why you look at your resources, right? That's why you ask around mm -hmm. because public school may not work for your kid. It may not work for your foster kid. And you may have to think outside the box. Being any sort of parent is thinking outside the box, mm -hmm. you know? And so you just, you just have to do it. Yeah. And advocating, pivoting, keep putting one foot in front of the other, you know, like, like you were saying, just keep trying and just keep searching for those resources. I, I love that so much where I want to go from here. Um, I really want to talk about what we were talking about before we started recording this session and kind of dive into some of the heavier conversations on sort of a, a lack of support that's going on right now. And I know of two people, uh, that have had a huge lack of support in, in the foster, in mm -hmm. their fostering journey. So, you know, you've talked to me and you've had really good experience with the department of child services in the past, but there is sort of a lack of support right now. So can you talk about why you think that is within the system right now? I think overall the system in itself needs reformed mm -hmm. at a local level. I think that there is a large lack of support for foster parents. And I was thinking about this as we were paused for a minute, but number one, there's not enough social workers. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so a lot of them have a lot of cases. And some things that I've noticed is that when there is a fire, like if a certain case, there's some emergency or some major thing going on, that case gets all the attention. And so, you know, if there is a foster parent looking for some kind of support, that's kind of going to go by the wayside mm -hmm. because they're too busy putting out these other fires. The lack of staff means that if too many referrals come in, which a referral is when the central office down in Boise calls and says, you need to go check out this family and see if these kids are safe. Sometimes we'll have two safety assessors out on call and a priority one will come in. And that means somebody has to go out immediately. And then again, you have to pull from a different place in the department, you know, within the CPS cover, but you have to pull a social worker to go check out this family. And so there really could be up to like a week or longer for you to get any sort of response back. Mm -hmm. Not to mention all these people still take vacations and time off and they're sick or their kids are sick. And so there almost needs to be a resource person that can strictly help foster parents who need help outside of the case, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if they need some sort of referral for therapy or a specialty or OT, PT, speech, there almost needs to be someone at the health and welfare office who that is all they do mm -hmm. is help these foster parents get these referrals. Sometimes what happens is like in my case, you have to have a consent of treatment from the biological parent. And if the social worker has to go track them down for several days, but then something else comes up, they're going to stop trying to track this parent down because this is no longer a priority. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think a lot of social workers like foster parents, they're burnt out mm -hmm. and it's hard because who suffers the foster parents and the foster kids mm -hmm. because they're not getting the help that they need. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think really, truly in the long run, it's ends up being the children because the parents aren't getting the help they need and they stop. They, they're, yes. they're like, I, I can't handle this because I have no support and I cannot keep doing this because it's, I think it feels like it's impossible. And yes. so now, now who's, who ultimately is suffering all, all of the children that need a place, a place mm -hmm. to go. These kids are now what's suffering because it's just that trickle down effect that's happening. And, you know, I, I, it's very frustrating for me from an outside perspective. And this is just like one example, but I have a friend that was just trying to figure out what grade their children should be going into, into the school year. Like, and I'm, I'm not talking like a couple of days that they hadn't heard. It was like a couple of weeks that they yeah. were just trying to figure out, I need to get them enrolled in school. I just need to know what grade I need to enroll them in. And they couldn't even get back to them on something like that, that, you know, and, and I'm sure right. there's so much more that goes into it, but when you're hearing these stories from an outside perspective of, of anybody would be interested in in fostering. And then you start hearing these, these stories, you're just like, wow, that sounds really shitty. That sounds incredibly frustrating. Like why, it, why it, would I want to help with something like that? It truly is because, you know, you have to have their school records from their previous school. And sometimes you, as the foster parent, aren't allowed to call the previous school and have them sent over. Right. I've had kids that I could not enroll them until the social worker went to the school with me and enrolled them. Mm -hmm. And then kids ended up being late starting school because 
we couldn't get the social worker to find time in their schedule. And I'm like, this isn't like we can reschedule a doctor's appointment. We're holding this child from starting school because you were not able to find an hour in your schedule. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just so how it's do incredibly you incredibly frustrating? So how, what would be your advice or what would, how do you handle that? How would you handle that? Other than just like, I mean, it's so hard to just be like, get a thick skin or do what you can or, but like, really like, I mean, people are like angry and frustrated. Like, what do I do with that? I, I am a mama bear and I truly am not someone you want to cross. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I will call multiple times I will call the front desk Mm -hmm. and say I have been trying to get this I can't get a hold of the social worker this kid is starting school in two weeks I need to get them registered you I need a supervisor or Mm -hmm. I need somebody else I there have been times that I have disagreed with what the social worker has done and I have emailed their boss in Coeur d'Alene I and I don't do it vindictively. I do it because there is not an accountability kept. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of like, well, if these kids are in a safe place, then they're fine. But now we have, say, a sibling set of six coming into care. We got to figure this out right now. Well, yeah, this kid is in a foster home and they're safe, but are you going to tell them they have to start school a week late because you can't get any social worker? It doesn't even have to be their social worker. You can't get any social worker to call and get their school record sent over Mm -hmm. or you can't, you know, I've had kids who couldn't get medical care because all foster kids get switched over to Idaho Medicaid if they're not already on it. And it's like, Thankfully, you know, I know there's a lot said about Valley Med, but if they know that they're in foster care and the state is working on getting their Idaho Medicaid, they'll at least let you bring them in, Mm -hmm. you know, but there's places that don't do that. And kids go without services because it's just not a priority. And so I feel like you have to, again, and I know I keep saying it, you have to advocate, you have to make multiple calls. You have to say, this has to be done. I'm calling back in three days to make sure you did this. Mm -hmm. I'm calling back. You need to email me. And if you have to find out who, you know, is the supervisor, find out who's in Coeur d'Alene and then send an email to the social worker, CC the, you know, CC the supervisor, CC the person in, you know, any random person in Coeur d'Alene, for goodness sakes, Mm -hmm. you know, put it out there to be like, hey, these kids need to start school and I'm not getting any sort of help. Right. Well, what we were talking about earlier before we started recording is it seems it seems like they are putting unrealistic They're They're making unrealistic promises, um, and setting new foster parents up with unrealistic expectations of the amount of support that they will have. So foster, what I've heard from multiple friends that uh, Mm -hmm. have gone through, Oh man, the ringer, like the ringer of their journey is that they were really under the impression that they were going to have more support and better contacts and a way to get the help they need, especially as not ever being biological parents. Um, right. You know, there's other things that go into, into being a foster parent that, you know, if you've never, and you know, this, you've already talked about that. If you've never been a biological parent, like you have questions, there's some stuff Mm -hmm. that I have to figure out. I've never had to establish discipline or rules in my house or, you know, just what goes into parenting on all scales, you know, you're kind of just a little bit thrown into it in a sense. And then, but with the understanding that there's going to be support and there's going to be people that you call. So when you have a major problem or there is questions that you have, there's nobody. 
or at least the sense that there's nobody because nobody's returning phone calls. If they do, it's not right away. And then you're always getting put on the back burner for back burner for some of these other emergency type situations. And what I'm hearing is like, we would like to be on the front burner just once, just one Mm -hmm. time. So it's, it's really sad for me and frustrating. I'm sure for these parents to know, to, to go into this with these unrealistic expectations of that. So to me, it's what I'm hearing from you and advocating for your child and hearing from my friends is you really have to go into this with a sense of resilience and a sense of like figuring this out. And I'm, and I'm going to figure this out independently because the support that you think might be there could possibly not be there. And that doesn't, and and to me, like COVID happened, right? So then Mm -hmm. you just never know what's going to happen in the world anyway. So COVID happened and that's really changed a lot of things too. So, I mean, would you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think that COVID definitely changed things in that a lot of people had to learn how to do visits within their home because Mm -hmm. they all had to be virtual. Um, Social workers were working from home. And so there were distractions at home. Um, I definitely think we're now somewhat back to normalcy. Like they do have visits at the state building now. All of the social workers are back at the building. So I think I think that there is, it's starting to get back to normal. I think mm-hmm. the hard thing is right now, and this is United States wise, there is such a shortage of foster parents mm-hmm. that I almost feel like sometimes they will say anything to get foster parents. And then it's like, well, once we get them, then they'll see how fulfilling this is and it'll be great. Well, no, you're just going to burn out your foster parents. Mm -hmm. And so it, you know, you have this social worker burnout, but even with social worker burnout, you have no choice but to replace the social worker. If you have foster care, foster parent burnout, you don't just have a backup foster parent wait, you know, finishing up college and ready to save the world. And so with that lack of support, the state needs to look at why don't we have more foster parents? Why, why are we losing them at an astronomical rate? Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be that foster parents in Idaho would be parents for years and years and years. And now we're seeing a much shorter span of people being foster parents for a shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of the kids. It's not because of the parents. So what is the only other factor it could be? Mm -hmm. Lack of support, lack of contact from you know, social workers, you know, uh, any kind of resource help, you know, you're, they just need to take a better look at how can we help these people? How Mm -hmm. can we hire someone or, you know, intern, have hire an intern that'll come in and strictly do these small, small things for these foster parents. Mm -hmm. Like here, okay, you need to know what grade your kid's going into. Awesome. First name, last name, birthday. I'll look it up for you. I'll shoot you an email. I'll shoot you a text. I'll give you a phone call. Mm -hmm. But they need to take a look at because what's going to end up happening is we already are so short on foster homes and all foster homes are full and you're going to just burn the foster parents out and then you're going to have nobody left. Yeah. So do you think it would help foster parents going into it? Like knowing now that the, the system needs some work, right? So new foster parents or even existing foster parents, but I'm just thinking like new 
foster parents going into it, if you build up a support system, cause I, I, I really feel like that's why you have thrived and, mm-hmm. and been so successful is because you already had an existing support system with your family and you weren't afraid to reach out and ask for help. I saw you do that multiple times on social media. You ended up having a, a foster mom shower. Mm-hmm. I mean, you had all of these really beautiful connections and support and you made the effort to do that. So would you, I mean, do you think that that goes into play for all foster parents that maybe initially what you need to do is make sure you have a huge circle or a good circle, like a solid group of things that you could do to get help with kind of before going into it. Or if you are struggling right now, figure out a couple of other areas that you could get help with outside of like the system. Is that like a very naive thing for me to say? I don't know if that's naive. No, I think, you know, I think the thing is, is that foster parents are taught so much about like what it looks like to be a foster parent, what help you're going to get, what I think they're just set up for unrealistic expectations. And I Mm -hmm. think that, especially when I first went into foster care, I thought, oh, I'm going to change the system. I know it's broken. Well, six years into it, I realized you're not going to change the system. And I think if you come to the realization of you have to find your own help. So whether that be other foster parents or other former foster parents or you know trainings or whatever you can find you don't even need a big circle Amy you need two or three people Mm, okay and you know like I said before every foster parent is given a resource peer mentor but I've had good resource peer mentors and I've had resource peer mentors that I just didn't talk to at all Mm -hmm. because I would call them with a frustration over something that the department did that I didn't feel was in the best interest of my kid and I would hear well I know but they have to okay I don't need you to tell me what they have to do because I know what they have to do Mm -hmm. I need you to tell me that it's okay for me to be upset And it's okay for me to advocate for what I feel is best for my child who is in my home 24 seven. And so sometimes if you have somebody outside, that's not connected to the department in any way that, you know, you can just go to, and that person's going to be like, dude, that sucks. And I am so sorry. How can I support you? Mm -hmm. Well, there are times that I'm like, you know what, all I needed was to yell and you just let me think. Mm -hmm. And there's other times that's like, you know what, today was a rough day with the kids. They were climbing up the walls. They were screaming and crying. Can you bring us dinner? You know, you don't necessarily always have to have like this big grand gesture. Sometimes it's, let me come sit well, you do the dishes, you know, so you have someone, especially being a single mom, I want somebody above the age of three to talk to. You know? yeah. So yeah. sometimes it's just, I feel that. Stay, I feel that. Stay at home moms. You're like, I just want to talk to someone my age, you yes. know? Yes. Like, so, you know, if you go into it thinking, I'm not going to change the system. I just have to learn how to work around the way the system already is. And you find those couple of people who are going to be a good support for you, no matter what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And then you just be that squeaky wheel, like send those emails, send those text messages, make those phone calls. If you're not getting a hold of your social worker, call the front and ask for a supervisor. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not getting a hold of them, tell them that you need a different social worker because you need to know such and such and you need to know right away. You know, it Mm -hmm. may be that the person at the front desk can look that up for you. It may be that they can't, but how are you going to know if you don't make those phone calls, send those emails or shoot those text messages, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And that's, and, and the reality of the situation is, is that's just the reality of the situation. So just knowing like you may call and not have an answer 
you may call and not hear back. So what Mm -hmm. are you going to do going into it with just kind of the, I'm going to try this. We're going to do it. We're going to make the phone call. We're going to try and get the information. If I can't get there, this is what we're going to do next. And just making a decision or pivoting. And to me, that sounds like a very proactive approach in, in continuing to advocate instead of waiting. I hate waiting for other people. Mm -hmm. Um, I hate relying on other people. And I think as women, especially strong women, we feel that way. Like I want to get this done and I want to do Mm -hmm. it myself and I want to do it yesterday. So I, my patience sometimes really is lacking. And I think for a lot of women, that's how we are. It's like, I have this in my mind that we need to do this, or I want to do this. And so when I'm waiting around for other people, it's very, very difficult for me. So, but just knowing like, okay, if we hit a roadblock here, I have another route. It's not my end game. I'm going to keep moving forward because it's still progress. And along the way, you're going to still keep learning as you go down that road. Right. And I, I will say this is I think a lot of times foster parents, especially women go into it thinking, and I, I, heard this from several foster parents, but they go into it thinking, well, I don't want to cause any waves because Mm. then I won't get a call for a placement or I don't want to cause any waves because I don't want to make anybody upset. Okay. Well, being a normal parent, not normal, being a biological parent, you're going to make people upset. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of just have to do it, Mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, you may tick off a social worker and they may be mad at you, but I have had several social workers come back to me and say, you know what? You were right. I was mad, but you were right. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and you can't, there is no such thing as a perfect foster parent. The perfect foster parent is the person who never gives up and advocates like crazy for that kid. And not always just for the kid. I mean, there have been times that I've had to advocate for a bio parent and stand up and the judge is like, you know, how is the kid doing? Well, they're doing great, but the state is not wanting to give so-and-so more time and they need time to find housing. And the judge is like, oh, really? Is that all that they have left? Yeah, that's all they have left. Oh, well, we're gonna give them three more months to find housing. That when, social worker yes. was not my best friend after that. Yeah. In fact, she still to this day does not like me. But you know what? It That's was okay. my responsibility because I knew that kid needed to be with her mom. Mm-hmm. And so you can't look at this as I have to be the perfect parent. You have to look at it as what is in my kid's best interest. Because they're not your foster kid. They're not your adoptive kid. For the time they are in your home, they're your kid. Mm -hmm. So what am I going to do that's going to be in their best interest in the long run? How Mm -hmm. am I going to help them? Mm -hmm. So um, that goes into earlier, you mentioned that the state has really, and maybe it's not the state, but they've really pushed within the system, um, the reunification. So getting the child back to their parents Mm -hmm. at all costs. Um, So to me, you advocating for the parent in that way is a great example of working with the parent in order to um, create a, a more, what's the word I'm looking for? Like fluid reunification process. Yes. You know, so if we know going into it that, you know, they want to, you know, reunify them at all costs, that that's the expectation. That's what they're doing. So if you can work with um, the child and with the biological parent, um, in, in, in that process, I feel like that just really helps the situation go more smooth. So I advocating for the parent was something that I would have never really even thought about having to do or wanting to do and advocating for yourself, getting the help and support that you need, not just for the child, but I mean, you need to advocate for yourself as well. Right. Right. And if you, you know, I mean, like I said, I, I had a counselor, I still have a counselor, you know, Mm -hmm. because it, it is, it's a rough thing to go through, you know, foster care is not easy. And Mm -hmm. sometimes you just need someone to be like, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing ever. I'm going to quit right now. And they're like, okay. And then you're like, 
wait, what? Don't tell me it's okay to quit. And they're like, well, you said you wanted to. And you're like, well, I do, but I don't. And right, you know, right. so it's like, you just sometimes need someone to like, listen to your ridiculous, like not make sense thinking for you to come back and be like, oh no, this is what I want to do. Or, you know, this is where I'm at. Or I see this parent working really hard. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that I would encourage foster parents, whether new or old, don't judge the parent based off the first six months, because a lot of times these parents are just surviving for six months and it takes months. Sometimes it takes a parent 10 months. And then all of a sudden it's like something clicks in their brain and they're like, Oh crap, I'm going to lose my kid. I better get my crap together. Mm -hmm. You know? And if you've already made up in your mind, Oh no, they don't want their kid. Well, you know, I mean, The truth is, is like with Kennedy, you know, like I told you before we were recording, they left her at the hospital at 12 hours old Mm -hmm. and never came to visit, not one time in 18 months. And the entire, even up to her adoption day, even after termination of parental rights happened, I still like had that tiny bit of thought in the back of my head of, you know what, maybe this is the minute that they're going to decide to get it together, Mm -hmm. you know, and even now after she's adopted, I still have those moments where I think, well, maybe I'll get an email saying that they're doing really good, or maybe I'll get this email from them saying that they finally got it together. So I think when you are rooting for the bio parent, even in different ways, you're always going to think well, maybe this is the time that they're going to get it together. And that's kind of what the bio parents need Mm -hmm. is because the social worker is there to tell them what to do to get their kid back. You're there to be like, man, I know this seems like a lot, but I think you can do it. Mm -hmm. How can I help you? You know, I've given rides home from visits. I've taken people to the store to teach them how to use WIC when they were like still those dumb checks. Mm -hmm. Like, I've had parents who are like, I don't know how to use these. And I'm like, oh, here, I'll take you to Winco. I'll show you how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's amazing. The bio parents, they just need someone to teach them and to root for them. Mm -hmm. And you're that person. Mm -hmm. I love so much that you're putting that energy out into the world too. That, that sense of optimism. I think we as humans really have lost. (laughs) A lot of us have really lost in that love, that love for everybody. It's just, I, it's absolutely amazing, Sasha. So I know you need to probably get ready to go. I, um, I want to wrap this up. I I know your time is precious and you have some things going on. So (laughs) I didn't actually mean to keep you this long, but thank you so much for this conversation. But I, we have years of talking to make up for it. I know. I know. Okay. So (laughs) really quick, can you share with us what your, where you're at next on your journey? Like, where are you going now? Uh, Before we started recording, you said you're not currently fostering at the moment. You're on a little bit of a pause because you're blank. So yeah. So (laughs) I am kind of trying to figure out what I would like to do, but, um, I actually really want to, um, support biological parents. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what that looks like because there's not really anywhere in our area that has a program that does that. Um, but a lot of times with biological parents, they're just told, we'll do the bare minimum so you can get your kid back. And I get that. But in the same hand, like I've said several times, they don't know how to parent necessarily. And Mm -hmm. so I feel like I would like to teach them, not necessarily because I'm the most amazing parent in the world, but how do you cook? for picky eaters? How do you go shopping? How do you use the food banks? How do you use WIC? You know, how do you find resources to help with childcare for your kid to help make bio parents more successful in getting and keeping their kids back Mm -hmm. um, and not having them come back into care. There is an amazing organization called Homes of Hope. 
um, and they have a closet for foster kids. They have scholarships for foster kids. They have all kinds of trainings for foster parents. And um, I keep hoping that one day I'm going to open my email and they're going to be like, hey, we just started this new program and it'll be to mentor bio parents. <laughs> that hasn't happened yet. You need to propose so, it. You need to just do it. I know. Yeah. I know. So that's kind of where I'm at. Like, yeah. I know my heart is always with the kids, but mm-hmm. it's kind of shifted to these bio parents need more than just a social worker telling them what to do and what they're doing wrong. They need someone to come alongside them and be like, yeah, that wasn't a very smart decision, but Hey, let's move forward and let's do something different. You know, Mm -hmm. sometimes they just need somebody that believes in them. I know I have a lot in my life. And so I think that's what everybody needs. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, I love that. I'm excited for this next journey you're on because you're taking your, um, expertise, you're taking all of the knowledge that you've learned and bottling it up and taking it even further and helping by helping the parents. I think that's amazing. I super inspired by you. I think you're incredible. Seriously. It's just your journey and what you've been through and what you're doing is so inspiring. And I know other parents will find it inspiring. Also other foster parents, other moms, Um, I think that this is really important for all moms to listen to all women, because now we know how to better support our friends who are interested in going into the foster care system or being, becoming, um, foster parents. We know how to better support you. Um, we know that you just maybe need us to show up with a cup of coffee and, a and to sit at, sit at the kitchen table while you do the dishes. You know, I, I think that's so I think that's so powerful for us to know, um, in several of the other episodes that I've had, it's like, well, well, what do we do as moms? If we're not going through that situation right now, how do we help our friends? How do we help other moms? And this was great for us to know, know what to do in those situations. So, um, yeah. So, um, Sasha, do you mind if I put your, uh, Facebook, um, page out there or is it okay if people reach out to you for questions if yes, you have any of course okay always um so is face is your facebook page the best uh resource probably okay yeah okay that's and then, probably the easiest way to reach me um and then do you have any other well actually you can just let me know and i'll put it in the show notes you can let me know after we're done recording just any other tools and resources that people can have um in their foster care journey i will put okay. that in the show notes as well and um is there anything that you would like to add that we didn't cover today. I know we talked about a lot. I don't think so, but I'll probably think of something as soon as we're done. (laughs) Okay. Well, eventually I'm starting to do live Q and A's with, um, uh, with people I've had on the show. So if anybody has any questions, we could always offer that as an option as well. They can always reach out to you. They can reach out to me and we can, you know, answer questions through DMS that way as well. So yes, I'm always available. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sasha. I really appreciate you coming on today. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye. Hey, mama friend. Thank you so much for joining me in this incredible conversational journey with Sasha. I think we can all agree that she's beyond inspirational. I'm so blown away with the things that she's doing, her passion for helping other people, not just the children that she's fostering, but also the support that she has for the parents as well. If you liked today's episode, please share it with another mama friend. Also, please don't forget to go onto iTunes and leave me a rating and review that helps immensely more than I could ever explain to get this word out. I will be sure to put Sasha's contact information in the show notes below and also any tips and resources that she has for us as well. Please don't hesitate to reach out to her. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you do have any specific questions or you would like to hear more about this kind of a conversation. I am happy, happy to find other guests to come on the show and talk about things that you're interested in. So don't forget to follow me on Instagram. We also have our group Facebook page as well, where we can can continue to have this conversation. So thank you so much for listening today. I want you all to please remember whatever journey you're on, whatever path you're going down that I believe in you. I care about you. And I'm so incredibly proud of you. Thank you so much for listening today, sweet mama. I look forward to talking to you again soon.